log entry, the catch Scarlet Queen, Philip Carney, master. Position, 9 degrees, 13 minutes south, 146 degrees, 30 minutes east. Wind fresh, sky fair. Remarks? Departed Port Moresby, New Guinea, after completion of salvage and rescue mission. Reason for mission? The derelict and the wandering boy. We were 50 miles off the Lewis Aid Archipelago, standing across the Coral Sea when we ran into the wall of rain. It blotted out the whole world. From the wheel, I could hardly see the Queen's bowsprit or the tops of her spars. And it continued. It brought squalls with it. The drops slanted across our decks and bit at us like insects. With nightfall, the visibility dropped to zero. We reefed sail, leaving aloft only enough canvas to give us headway. We inched forward, blindly, into complete streaming darkness. I was at the wheel and my chief mate Gallagher was below. He'd been at the radio sending out our position, speed, and course to any ships that might be in our vicinity. In an hour, he hadn't found any. It didn't take long to realize that things had changed when he came out of the cabin. Well, I got some great news for you, Skipper. What's up, Red? Uh, a distress call from the steamship Lawson. Captain Mark Reedy. And a great night. Holy... Oh, <laughs> What's her position, Red? She's aground on a reef about 20 miles east of here in Messima Straits. She's our baby, Skipper. There's not another ship within 12, 14 hours of her. With visibility like this? Yeah. Okay, Red, we'd be a fine pair if we didn't take a crack at it. Hey, Gordon! Aye, sir. Break out the watch. Stand by to trim sail. We're changing course. Aye, sir. Oh, here's a... Go on, plot us a course, Red. We'll see if we can find her. And so Mutual continues The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen, written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman, and starring Elliot Lewis. The Scarlet Queen, proudest ship to plow the seas, bound for uncharted adventure. Every week, a complete entry in the log. And every week, a league further in the voyage of the Scarlet Queen. We maintained radio contact with the Lawson as we groped blindly toward her through the rain. We learned that she was a small thousand-tonner, carrying mixed cargo and eight passengers. She was aground by the head, a hole torn in her forward plates by the sharp coral of the reef. We requested her to rig her brightest searchlight and to swing its beam in the direction of our approach. But a few hours later, when we picked our way carefully into Massima Straits, it was her steam whistle that caught our attention. Its monotonous call reached out for us across the rain-swept water. Then we picked up the faint glow of her light. And 40 minutes later, we pulled alongside. Okay, Red, toss her aboard. Good, Red. Send one hawser aboard, Red. We'll keep a strain and stay off the reef with the engine. All right, Nielsen, that stop at bow line will do. Call the take a turn around the gypsy. Hey, and the lock and... Yeah! Send a couple of men to give me a hand at the ladder. I'm coming aboard. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up our call, Captain. We're in a bad I way. I can believe it. She sounds like she's ripping her belly out on the reef. Are you the first officer? That's right, sir. Tom Griss. Where's Captain Reedy? Oh, up in the chart room, most likely. Three sheets to the wind, the way he was when he piled us up on this coral. If he doesn't lose his papers over this one, I'll be shark bait. Uh, 
I'd better pay him my respects, don't you think? Well, the ladder to the bridge deck is right through that passageway. I'd better stay on deck. Okay, Chief. See you later. As I stepped through the passageway, the sounds of rain and water lowered. And the groan of the ship's bottom tearing itself on the reef seemed louder. I swung up the ladder leading to the bridge deck, past half a dozen frightened passengers huddled in the ratty little dining saloon below me. I found the chart room door just forward of the top of the ladder. Who is it? And who might you be? Captain Philip Carney, the catch Scarlet Queen. What might you be doing forcing entry into my ship's chart room? We've picked up your distress call, Captain. We're standing by to... Distress call? Why, that mutinous devil, he took it on himself, did he? He'll be up before the shipping board for this. Mr. Grayson! Mr. Grayson, report to the chart room! Ah, he won't even answer me. Mutinous fool. Captain Mark really never sent out a distress call in 40 years at sea. Cast off your ship, Captain. Leave me alone. You better drink some coffee and get yourself back on an even keel. You got a ship breaking up under you. It's my ship. You can have her, Reedy. She won't live through a change of tide. Rising water will lift her free so she'll sink from that hole in her bow. And she'll capsize if the water falls with her head jammed on the reef the way it is. Take your choice. Would you join me in a drink, Captain? No, thanks. I'm going down and start transferring your passengers to my ship and as much of your valuable cargo as I can handle. Oh, wait a minute, Captain. Yeah? This... This is my ship. I I don't know what you think of me. I don't mind telling you. I think your line should have retired you ten years ago. I don't think you're fit for a command. Sit down, son. I want to ask you one question. Make it short. How long have you been sailing these waters, son? Long enough to stay afloat, Captain Reedy. (laughs) I been navigating this run from the Solomons and Lewis Aids to Port Moresby since I was as young as you. Yeah, yeah. Drunk and sober through calm and gale. Yeah, well, you only have to miss once, you know. <sighs> Just let me finish, son. I come in to Massima Strait tonight the same way as I come in a hundred or two hundred nights before, standing the wheel myself. Now, you don't do it by chance, son. Not when you make it as many times as I have. Come on, get to the point, Captain. Well, it's a lighted channel, boy. As long as you keep it well on your starboard, you miss this cluster of reefs. That's why it's there. Why are you giving me this story, Captain? Because the channel boy was on my starboard, son. Well on my starboard, like it's meant to be. Uh As sure as I'm sitting here, son. Captain... Captain... uh, Carney. Phil Carney. Carney. My case will look better in Admiralty Court if... If I can prove I went aground due to accident instead of carelessness. Yeah, I know. You think the channel boy broke loose? That's what I think. I I know it was well on my starboard where where it belongs when I went aground. It'll not take you long to have a look, Captain. The boy is still there on the starboard. Yeah, it won't take long for this tub to capsize a sink. (laughs) They'll take my command, Captain. I'll pay you for your trouble if that's what you want. I've been a seafaring man all my life, son. I know nothing else. All right, Captain Reedy, I'll start putting your passengers aboard my ship, then I'll go take a look. You better start getting your gear ready, too, if you want to keep a deck under you. If you find the boy out of position, I'll leave with you, Carney. If you don't, I think I'd rather stay with my ship. You're old-fashioned, Captain. Uh, We'll talk about it later. You could feel the gentle jarring of the ship grinding on the reef now. It seemed as though the fore and aft angle was becoming steeper as the tide dropped from beneath the stern. When it went far enough, I knew the ship would tear loose from the coral and settle on its port side. Two of the passengers waited for me at the bottom of the ladder, a man, paunchy and badly used by the tropics, and a younger woman with a calm, almost indolent expression in her dark eyes. The man's expression and attitude were different. Captain Carney, I am Frederick J. Wade, the Owen Stanley Gold Mines Limited. This is my wife. Hello, Captain. Yeah, how do you do? Uh, wait, uh, Captain, wait. I must have a word with you. Make it short, Mr. Wade. I'm going to start putting you passengers aboard my ship. The very question that was in my mind, Captain. But it, it so happens that I am traveling with a fabulous cargo. Uh, he doesn't mean me, Captain. Well, that's a little surprising, Mr. Wade. Don't interrupt, Freedom. It so happens, Captain, that my company placed me in charge of the transport of over 3,000 ounces of gold from our mines on the island of Bud S to Port Moresby. 
We had the misfortune of being forced to use this miserable bottom. So I must you ask must you to... You must ask me to save it for you. Yes. Uh, you will be amply repaid for its safe delivery. I'll do what I can. What you can, sir? Good heavens, it must be saved. Look, all. I got eight passengers and probably 20 crewmen to put aboard my ship. Wait, if there's time and room after they're taken care of, we'll load your gold. Oh, well, then by all means, Captain, let us proceed with all the speed we can muster. I'll go to my cabin and prepare myself for the transfer. <laughs> he takes good care of me, doesn't he? Well, don't worry, Mrs. Wade. You're surrounded by men to take care of you. <laughs> that sounds interesting. But I'm not worried. Our condition isn't as serious as you led my husband to believe, is it? Tom said we didn't have anything to worry about. Tom? Yes. You mean Grierson, the chief officer? Uh-huh. Tom to his friends. Yeah. Well, I hope Tom's right. But in case he isn't, I think you'd better get your stuff ready, too. <laughs> It would be quite a feather in your cap to salvage as much gold as we have aboard, wouldn't it, Captain? To say nothing of the money it would put in your pocket. You think I'm scaring you off this hulk just so I can earn a salvage fee? You better find a life jacket. We'll pick you out of the water when you find out I'm not kidding. The rain had lightened by the time I got out on deck. The clouds above were beginning to thin and silver some from the moonlight above them. Grierson stood by the ladder waiting for me. Well, did you get him sobered up, Captain Oh, uh, Yeah, Grierson. He was making headway when I left. I want you to start putting your passengers aboard the Queen. I'll be back before you finish with him. Where are you going? My chief mate and I are going to take our small boat and row up and take a look at that channel light. What the devil are you going to do that for? Well, maybe your skipper wasn't as drunk as you thought he was. He seems to think that boy broke loose and is out of position. He's crazy. You must be two to go along with that. He was just drunk, that's all. It won't take long to find out, Grierson. If it's true the boy broke loose, he won't lose his master's ticket. So at his age, I guess he deserves somebody looking into it, huh? It's your time, Connie. Go ahead and waste it. Thanks. I like to see an officer support his captain the way you do. Go on, get started with the passengers. Gallagher! Yes, Skipper! Get Nielsen set to receive passengers! You put the small boat over the side. We're going for a short trip. In 20 minutes, Red and I had pulled 100 or so yards to the lighted channel boy, picking our way through the reef points by the phosphorescence swirling in the currents around them. We shipped our oars. Red held us steady at the light while I threw a painter around it. It made us fast. Yeah. It broke loose, all right. If you kept this on your stop, you would... Look, Red. I want to raise this cable if I can. Yeah, coming up. Yeah, thanks. Red. What do you got, Skipper? That drunken captain didn't know how right he was. Why, what do you got? It didn't break loose, Red. Somebody moved this boy. The metal cable usually used to anchor boys had been cut, and a heavy manila line bent on in its place. That meant that the Lawson had been deliberately sent aground. And with $100,000 worth of gold aboard her, it wasn't hard to figure why. Captain Reedy, I checked on the board. Oh, Grierson, I'm glad you're here, too. I'm trying to get the old man out of well, here. Well, it's all right for you to go, Captain Reedy. The light had been moved, all right. It what? I told you, son. I told you something was wrong. How do you know it was moved, Connie? The boy had been cut loose from its cable and re-anchored in its new position with a heavy piece of manila line. Oh, hold back, son. You you mean it was done on purpose? Yeah. And if you weren't drowned in that liquor, you'd know why. It was done by someone who knew you had that gold aboard and knew where you were taking it. Who'd know all that? By the devil, son. You would, Captain. You would, Grierson. What are you talking Frederick about? Frederick J. Wade would, so would his wife, Frieda. How about it, Grierson? Are you accusing me, Connie? I'm asking you, why did you tell Frieda that you had nothing to worry about? Well, I, I just didn't Were you wanna... expecting another ship and another crew to board you? I, I just told her that so she wouldn't worry and go uh, all to pieces. Maybe you and she are working together. Now, uh, wait Mr. a minute, Grierson, Connie. this is hard to believe. You're making wild guesses. Why suspect me? Why not the old man here? He's the one who sent me to check the boy, remember? Oh, never mind. Wade has offered to pay me for salvaging that gold. I'm taking him up on it. I suppose I'll see both of you later. Captain Connie, 
Are we in danger? Wait. I saw you rush up to the bridge deck. I've been waiting for you. Oh, I thought you'd be aboard the Queen with the rest of the passengers. Oh, Frida and I stayed here. I wanted to be sure you'd move my gold aboard your ship. And Frida, I suppose, wanted to be near that scoundrel Grierson. Well, that's her affair, not mine. Where is Frida, Wade? Oh, heaven knows. With him, I suppose. Why? Wade, this ship being aground is no accident. There's no accident? Well, who did it? Somebody aboard was in on it. I figured that another ship's supposed to arrive to take your gold off. My good heavens. Oh, but surely... You said they... yourself she was paired off with Grierson. It would be a good enough haul for anybody. Oh, no, no. Oh, but, Captain, you, you are going to salvage my gold. Well, like I told you, I'll do what I can. Look, you can help. Oh, anything you say, Captain, and I can assure you, you'll be generously rewarded by my company upon the successful completion of the operation. All right, wait. Where is your gold? Locked in two strong boxes in the purser's office, to all of which I have the keys. Give me the one in the office. Then get aboard the Queen and tell Mr. Gallagher to douse all lights and get ready to receive your boxes. I'll get some steam into these winches and send them down to you. As you say, Captain. Right away. I watched his portly figure disappear through the passageway. Then I started to work. If there was another ship in on the deal, I figured that the bad visibility had slowed her up. The sky was clearing now. I decided to give them as little help in finding us as I could. I found the master light panel. I killed all the deck lights first. Then I started on the main house. Just as I was reaching for the switches to dock in the saloon, I heard a step scuff the deck behind me. I pulled the switches, threw myself prone before I even looked. <laughs> first shot screamed off the bulkhead just above me. When the flash died, I rolled into a new position. The second one missed me by a more comfortable margin. Then I heard steps fading aft down the companionway. I got to my feet, made what speed I could through the pitch darkness after them. I heard a door slam just ahead of me and to my right. I groped for it, found it, went in. Tom! Drop the gun, Frida. Who is it? I can't see Drop you. the gun. I haven't got a gun. Drop. I haven't got a gun. I didn't have one. Then who threw the shots? I don't know. Oh, it's you, Captain Connor. Yeah, who threw the shots? I don't know. How should I know? What's happening, Captain? Why don't you drop the act, Frida? Is your boy Grierson gunning for me? Tom, why should he? Maybe because I'm taking the gold off and messing up his chances of you two doing a fast disappearing act with it. Captain Connie, what are you saying? Oh, look, you aren't kidding anybody, especially your husband. I never tried to kid anybody. Frederick knew I was going to divorce him and marry Tom, but the gold... Somebody I... arranged things so that this ship would go aground. The best motive is the gold. Oh, no, he couldn't have. He couldn't have done that. Done what? Oh, he was so determined to get a ship command, and he hated Captain Reedy. But he wouldn't have done this to get one. For my dough, I wish that was behind it. Look, if you don't want to slide off into 30 fathoms when this hulk lets go of that reef, you better get over the side onto the Queen. Not without Tom. Where is he? I'd feel safer if I knew, gorgeous, but I don't. Come on. Let's no, get out on the deck. Let go of me. Let go of me. I ought to, but I took on a rescue I job and you're part Tom, of Tom, I won't go. You won't have to, Frida. Tom, Tom, darling, where are you? Don't try to find me, honey. Step away from me and get away from Carney. I don't want to hit you. All right, darling. It's time you and I settled this, Carney. It's not too much time this hulk is slipping. I heard what you told Frida, and I've taken enough of your meddling. As far as I can see, you haven't got anything on anybody aboard this ship. I'm stealing a man's wife, but that's no crime in any law book. You're so clean, why don't you save your story for the lawyers, Grayson? Because I want you squared away before I leave here. I'm not going on the block for this wreck. You keep forgetting that I'm the guy who ordered that distress message sent out. The lawyers are going to like that, aren't they? It's a good thing you did. Maybe with that bad visibility, the other ship couldn't find you. Wait a minute, Grayson. Don't try anything, Connie, I warn you. If you do, this gun goes off. Oh, wait a minute. Hey, where are you? Don't answer, Connie. I didn't have to. I saw the beam from a powerful flash streak into the dark companionway. I kept my back to it. When I saw it hit Grierson's face, saw his eyes wince from the sudden light, I moved in on him. Give me the gun! Hey, Skipper, this chunk of rust is... Come here, Red. Get a hold of this guy, will you? Oh, what the devil's going on? Keep Grierson off of me. I gotta talk to him. Come here, you... Now, calm down, Grierson. You and I both have been suckered in this deal. It was a good case against you. I don't blame you for blowing your top, but you can quit worrying. You're as clear as deep water. You're just over suspicious, Carney. I told you you didn't have anything on anybody on this ship. If somebody wrecked it to get that gold, they're from someplace else. The visibility just kept them from getting That's here. That's where you're wrong, Grierson. There is somebody on this ship. And if he'd been a little soberer, he'd have found me with one of those slugs back in the saloon. The old man? Yeah, Captain Reedy. 
He wanted the ship to go aground so he could split that gold with somebody. With the boy moved, he wouldn't be blamed for it. Huh? You got barnacles on the brain, Skipper? Reedy was the guy that sent us out to check on the position of that boy. Yeah, and that's where he made his mistake. He gave me that story about taking a sight on that boy. Mm. He was still trying to lift the blame from himself. But listen, with the zero visibility in that rainstorm, he couldn't have even seen that light. Much less kept it on his starboard. Well, what are you waiting for? You haven't got much time. Come on, Gallagher. Get those two aboard the Queen. I'll go take care of the gold. We slung the two strong boxes over the side and onto the decks of the Scarlet Queen with as much speed as we could get out of the rusty winches and the dying steam. The tide was still dropping and the decks of the Lawson were beginning to angle to port as well as steeply down by the stern. I headed for the chart room for the last time. Get away from that door. Come on, open up, Reedy. It's time to go. I said get away from that door. Come on, you rumhead. Look, what's a prison term to a worn-out old sea dog like you? They'll feed you better than you ate on this scow. Get away! Get away! The other ship will come for me. They'll never make it, Reedy. They were here yesterday. Come on, Reedy. I'll give you a hand. Get away or I'll turn you again. She's going, Reedy. Look, I haven't got time to argue. I'll ask you once more. Come on, sweat it out for a few years. You know what? Okay, you old pirate. Okay, old pirate. Get off of my ship! I'll sail into Port Mosby myself, you deserting rat! Red and I stood on the deck of the Queen, 50 yards off the reef, and watched. The tide had dropped so far that only the after half of the Lawson was in the water. The swells lifted it, twisted it, and dropped it a little lower each time. Finally, it couldn't hang on the reef any longer. It twisted a little more to port, enough to let the water rush into its after holes. The moon broke through the clouds for an instant. I saw the figure of Captain Reedy on the bridge deck, from where he'd commanded his ship for so many years. He stood there, pushing his weight against the list of his ship, looking out over the bow. Thirty seconds later, the Lawson was out of sight. There's nothing I like about a guy who'd murder his own ship. I don't know what made me hate to see him go that way. That crazy old sea dog. Uh-huh. Did everything I could to get him off, Fred. Sure you did, Skipper. Come on, we better get some cloth up and get out of here. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I guess I've seen enough of this reef. The morning broke fair and brisk. And that afternoon, we found our berth at Port Moresby. We put off our passengers and Frederick Wade's gold. The generous payment we received wasn't quite as generous as his build-up had been, but split among the crew, it was enough for everyone to send a few trinkets back to the States. Two days after that, we discharged our cargo and taken on another. Coffee and rubber for the warehouses of Darwin. We stood out of the harbor under power, found the wind... And put our figurehead onto a course up through Torres Strait and Arafura Sea. Stand by to make sail! The crew eager for an Australian port where girls on the street spoke their language and the girls in the bars spoke the same, jumped to their stations with a will. Let's stop a cheat! Make sail! The throat and peak halyards heaved the big mainsail into its working position. 
The jibs went up. Then the mizzen. And we trimmed them for a close reach under the steady breeze. Well, I guess we'll get there with this rig, huh, Skipper? Yeah, I think we might. If nobody moves a channel boy on it. Well, not having anything more valuable in our holes than a few thousand pounds of raw coffee and raw rubber, I guess there's no danger of that. Or passengers, Red. Passengers will cause trouble when a cargo won't. Yeah. That Dame Frida, for example. Oh, yeah. yeah. If she'd had a different type husband, the fur would have been flying. Uh, I don't know. With a wife like that, why should he be so interested in gold? Search me. But that Grierson brought up an interesting point. Huh? Stealing a man's gold is a crime, but stealing his wife isn't. How do you like that? Uh, well, let somebody else worry about it. The saints be praised, we aren't bothered by either. Oh, I don't know. We aren't exactly unattached. No, but she'll never leave with another first mate while I'm alive. <laughs> to the queen, Skipper? To the Scarlet Queen. After you, mate. After you. Log entry. The Catch Scarlet Queen. 5.30 p.m. Wind fresh, sky fair. Sea calm with long cross swell. Ship secure for night. Signed, Philip Carney. Master. Mutual invites you to sail into further adventure on the voyage of the Scarlet Queen next week at the same time. Porto Call, Darwin. The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen stars Elliot Lewis as Phil Carney with Ed Max as Gallagher. And tonight featured Ira Grossell as Captain Reedy. Clark Gordon played Grierson, John Daner was Wade, and Frida was Maya Gregory. Music scored and conducted by Richard Arant. The Scarlet Queen, a command radio production, is written by Gil Dowd and Bob Tallman. The Voyage of the Scarlet Queen has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. (laughs) 